So last week, several Wall Street brokerage firms quietly took steps to curb shorting against Reddit investor favorites, uh, Goldman, Bank of America, Citi, and, and, and Jefferies. They all took action. In fact, uh, Jefferies added, until further notice, Jefferies prime brokerage will no longer offer custody on naked options. Now, here's the rub, folks. Naked shorting is, was made illegal after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So the big question is, why is this still happening? Well, we're going to ask uh, attorney advocate against naked shorting, uh, naked short selling. Wes Christian is with us. And Wes, just first, if you care for the audience, people who are unfamiliar, what is naked shorting? Well, first, Charles, thanks for having me. Uh, naked shorting, simple version, is a seller sells stock that they don't have to a buyer who sees it in their account electronically, but it hasn't been delivered, and the buyer gives the seller money for ultimately nothing that was delivered. The simple version would be if you and I, Charles, took our car title and Xerox did a hundred times and sold it to a hundred people and each of them paid us cash, we, but we only had one car, that would be a good analogy to what naked short selling is. In Texas, simple version, we call that stealing. So that's, that's what naked <laughs> short selling is. Okay, and that would explain um how a GameStop could see 140% of the floats shorted because the same stocks were de facto borrowed or not borrowed again and again and again. No, no, no doubt. And, and there's really multiple reasons for, for why it still exists. W one is it's an enormously large problem, contrary to what some of the uh, other financial press says. For example, in 1993, uh, the fails to deliver were probably uh, several million dollars. By 2003, those fails to deliver in the aggregate were about $6 billion. According to a Suzanne Trembass book, Naked, Short, and Greedy, which came from a, the source of the SEC, just in two weeks in July, the fails to deliver were $17 billion. So at the end of the wow. day, uh, another, another study that Dr. Rob Shapiro, a former Undersecretary of Commerce, did many years ago, uh, he's with Sonicon now, uh, he did a study that showed that 500 million to a billion shares were not timely delivered, Charles. Now, to be fair, if you take that out 30 days, 60 days from when delivery should have occurred, that number goes to about half. But it is a systemic okay. problem. And, it, and it's, go ahead, sorry. So, so no, because I so, don't want to run out of time, and I, I've got a couple of other things. Hedge funds, we know, are, are, are big culprits. How, so, I mean, what do you, what's going to happen here? I guess let's cut to the chase. Will we see the SEC, will we see whoever's in charge take action on something that's happening, it's deemed illegal, it's harmful to the market? Will someone take action on behalf of individual investors? I think we're seeing a sea change. The, the, the reality is, who's really doing most of this from where I sit? And if you look at the regulatory actions at SEC.gov and FINRA, it's really the prime brokers. The reality is that there are some hedge funds, but it's the prop desk of the prime brokers who are doing the naked shorting from where I sit, or market makers. And so uh, ultimately, they've got to be looked at. And, and the SEC has fined a bunch of them for mismarking tickets uh, long when they're short, really, uh, for uh, pre-programming uh, pre computers to right. say a easy, right. hard to borrow stocks, easy to borrow. But ultimately, there is a movement and a sea change about not only because of the litigation we've done for 20 years with our whole legal consortium, but because of these uh, the Reddit groups and the subreddit groups, and frankly, more awareness being brought to this topic. Hopefully, also with the new SEC chairman that I'm hopeful will do something more than what's been done to date. Yeah. Yeah, Gin Ginsler has made comments that gives me hope as well. Everyone knows the problem. We know it's all about money. It's all about Wall Street making money at the expense of an honest stock market. And that's why a lot of individual investors have shunned the market. And once they've gotten in, they become victimized by this. Wes, I wish we had more time. We don't. Uh, congratulations, though. You've got a lot of people out there looking up to you and hoping that you can uh, continue that 20 years worth of work. I think we're right at the finish line. Joining me now, author of The War on Small Business, Carol Roth. Carol, you're a former investment banker. You're a Wall Street insider. You know how it all works. <laughs> Why does his naked shorting persist? 
All right. So first, Charles, a recovering investment banker, not quite former investment banker. It's like a 12-step process. Um, you know, as Wes mentioned, the practice of naked shorting is illegal. It has been so since the last Great Recession financial crisis. But like all of our regulation, there's always loopholes. And the loopholes uh, relate to making markets. And there can be an argument that it makes sense for market makers to have more flexibility for liquidity. But then they need to act responsibly. Responsibly. If you're looking at a derivative product as a hedge, that makes sense. But when the derivative product starts to exceed the market for that, starts to exceed the underlying product it's trying to hedge against, it's no longer a hedge. It is straight up right. gambling, and that should not be allowed. And frankly, that's why the last financial crisis was so bad, because the same thing happened with credit default swaps that made that market so much larger than the underlying mortgage market. So, so, and you, you always want to bring up, and I'll, and I'll let you do that now, that there is a distinction between legal shorting and this naked shorting, right? Yeah, I think that because this is so complex, a lot of these terms get convoluted. And so while naked shorting is a bad thing and it's a discussion around derivatives, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We don't want to say that all short sellers are bad because they provide an important function. They uncover information in the market about broken businesses um, and sometimes fraud. And certainly not every single short seller does that. But if you look at somebody like Carson Block of Muddy Waters, who published that anonymous paper that exposed the Lucan coffee fraud when everyone was touting it as the next Starbucks. We want to incentivize people to continue to do that. And it's a really hard job right. because not only do you have to be right, but your timing has to be right. And you've got a lot of money at stake. So right. it's important to distinguish yeah. from that function versus naked shorting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one thing to uh, distinction, right, to be able to find those things and another to be the weapon uh, to bludgeon these stocks. You know, on Friday, Bill Ackman's SPAC got clobbered. It was just the latest SPAC to get crushed. There's also a class lawsuit, action lawsuit out against Virgin Galactic. You know, and the reason I'm bringing this up, Carol, Wall Street, they get to call individual investors the dumb money, uh, and yet they get to make billions of dollars in all kinds of dubious investments. You just brought up some before. You know, and I just, I just think it bothers me that there's this sort of, uh, you know, if you, if you buy certain stocks, you're dumb. If you buy our products and they go straight down, well, it's okay. Yeah, they use the pejorative term dumb money because if they called them people who weren't in the know or weren't out the inside, then the entire game would be exposed, right? I mean, it's no secret that Main Street has been sold out to Wall Street by the Fed, by the government for more than a decade now, and it continues at an accelerating pace. And people are mad, and they should be mad. And even if they don't understand the underlying mechanism, it's clear that there are advantages, whether it's small business versus big business, whether it's retail investor versus the insider. If you are not on the inside, we don't have a free, free and fair market. We need to get back to free market capitalism where the game isn't being tilted in the direction of the big people who have the power and the control. Yeah, you would think uh, in, a, in a battle between David and Goliath, it would be enough just to be Goliath, but also to be able to have the rules in your favor and to change them mid-game that's a tough one. Carol, always appreciate these conversations. We'll talk again soon.